in 2006, probably 2005, anyway, uh, a good friend of mine, Clay Parrott, you guys have met him before, uh, Clay and I used to get together on my day off, so every Wednesday we would meet and we would have either lunch or breakfast, depending on schedules, and at that point, uh, I had been involved in, in ministry in different ways. I was, uh, a, I was a shepherd, uh, but that was the eldership at uh, Christ Church of Yukon. And so I had been, I, I was preaching over to the youth. I, did, I led small groups and Sunday school classes, uh, communion, offering meditations, you know, all of that was involved in a lot of different ministries. And I had a lot of people telling me that I needed to get in the, you need to do this full time. This is what you ought to be doing full time is in the ministry. And so Clay and I made the commitment, like I said, probably about 2005, 2006, that when we got together, we were going to eat some breakfast, eat some lunch, whichever it was, discuss, talk, you know, have some time together. And then we were going to break away and set aside time to pray. And one of the, one of the folks of the prayer was going to be that God would just make it clear to me where he was wanting me. And, and over that period of time, he slowly but surely just eliminated every uh, excuse I had for, for not getting into the ministry. And, and one day, it just became abundantly clear that that's, that's what I needed to do, okay? Uh, and so I, the, the reason I say that is because I think we've all been there. We've been in a place where uh, we're, maybe we got a big decision. It might be about, you know, taking a job or picking a college or, you know, should we have a kid or should we have another kid or should we, you know, whatever. And, and, and what we start to do is we suddenly become very intent and very focused upon seeking God's will. We, we want to make sure that we see God's will in this, that we make a wise decision. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Okay. I, I absolutely think that that is, is what, we, what we need to do. But I think that, you know, because, I mean, let, let's be honest, God only wants for you what you would want for yourself if you were smart, as God is, and we're not. So, but I, the thing is that sometimes, and here's where kind of our uh, dumb thing uh, it comes in, because there is kind of a, an attitude that it seems like in, in some parts of Christianity that, that basically God just has a blueprint for my life, okay? The, the God's got it all, it's all mapped out. Now, the thing is, that's a very comforting thought when things are going well. Not so much when things are not going well. That's not a real comforting thought when it feels like the wheels have come off the bus, okay? Because suddenly, what is the question then? The, the thought that goes through our mind is that if we think that God has a blueprint for my life, and now all of a sudden there is hurt and heartache that is going on in my community or under the roof of my house and my family, then why did God make this a part of the blueprint of my life? That's what we want to know. And... and Here's the deal. I, I want to say this. There is a difference between, there, there's two options here. We can believe in, that God has a blueprint for my life, or we can believe that God has a game plan for my life. And you say, well, they're the same thing. No, they're not. Anyway, if you ever had a house built, if you had a house built onto, you know, added onto or whatever, you've had blueprints drawn up. Blueprints are locked in, they are inflexible. And if you change things, you got to get a new set of blueprints. Okay? A game plan is not the case. Now, I say that, you know, I, I love, I'm getting all excited about, you know, football season in the fall. I'm all jazzed about it, okay? Not just because my son's going to be playing the band at OU. I love that too, but, you know, I'll still be wearing purple on Saturdays. So, uh, <laughs> I'm just telling you. But the, th the difference between a blueprint and a game plan is that a game plan is something that the coach puts together before the game, and it's the way that you want the game to play out. It's a plan for it. But you know what? Game plans, a lot of times, they get changed, they get adapted, they, they get thrown out the window sometimes when a quarterback gets hurt or when the weather is completely different than you thought it was going to be or when the other team has got one player who suddenly is just, I mean, is super, super hot. Those things change. That's why don't we give the great coaches – 
The, the great coaches, aren't they praised for their second half adjustments? For their halftime adjustments. That's what we praise them for is that they saw what was going on. They altered the game plan and come back and, and win the game, okay? And so we see that's the difference between a blueprint. Blueprints are inflexible. Game plans need to be flexible. They need to be changed. And so that's where we get into this of, and I, I say it's dangerous when we start to say that God has a blueprint for my life. Because that means that it is inflexible and it means that it is all laid out. And here, where do we get it? Jeremiah 29, 11. I love this verse, but Jeremiah 29, 11 says what? It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And so it's, it's all, I mean, it's mapped out. God's got it all laid out. But I, I want to, we're going to come back to that here in just a second. But when we start talking about the the game plan versus the blueprint illustration, I, I would submit to you, and I believe that the Bible teaches, that God deals with his children from the standpoint of a game plan rather than a blueprint. Now, back up here a second. There are times, yes, that we absolutely read in the scriptures that there are things that are laid out in exacting detail. They come to fruition exactly as God said they would. We see it in... Uh, we see it in the uh, the slavery in Egypt. We see it in the even in the exile. We find it in the prophecies that led to Jesus. I mean, we see it in the wilderness, even to the point of the way that the Israelites camped uh, when they went out into the wilderness. We find very exacting details, but th that is not to say that every single instance is mapped out in that detail, and so. And I think there's two problems with it, okay? Excuse me. When we believe, and this is the reason I, I, wanna, I want us to dispel this and understand this. When we, get, when we begin to believe that God has a blueprint for a life, there are a couple of, of detrimental effects. I think one of them is that it can cause us to question God because we're sure that it's laid out. And then just as I said, when, when suddenly, when there is illness, when there is tragedy, when there is heartache, when things are not going well, then what, what do we do? We begin to question God and ask, why did God make this part of the blueprint of my life? Why did he lay this out that this was going to happen? Okay? And, you know, the, the difference is, that, like I said, when we're talking about blueprints compared to uh, game plans, you know, sometimes accidents do happen. Sometimes things do occur. But I, that's, I think, one of the first detrimental aspects. It causes us to question God. The second is that I think the blueprint illustration, it, it paralyzes us many times. And you know what I mean, in business, they call it analysis paralysis because we want to make sure we make the right decision. And we get so caught up, we got to make the right decision. Because if God has a blueprint for my life, and I screw up the blueprint, I've screwed up my life. Right? I mean, if he's got it laid out, and, and this is the direction, and this is the turn, and I turn the wrong way, the whole thing's going to come crashing down. And so what do we do? We, we fret, and we worry, and we think. And as a result, we do what? Nothing. Because we're so afraid to act wrong that we don't act at all. All. And we spend all of our lives second guessing some of these things. You know, if I choose the wrong path or the wrong college or the wrong school, oh my goodness, what's gonna do? It's, oh, it's all gonna fall apart. I, I think that, you know, the other thing that happens is that it turns God into a consultant rather than a counselor. Because we start looking to God and, and our question is, tell me what you tell me what you want me to do. Tell me what the next step is. And so now what we're doing is we're looking at him, what? We're trying to find out what it is that we are to do. And so all of our prayer, it is all about trying to find that out. And, and the thing is, I want to I go to something here, because there's, there's another verse that talks about God's will. It is in the New Testament. It's Romans chapter 12. And what's funny is it talks about finding God's will, but the first thing that it talks about is being renewed being transformed. Romans 12, 2, he says, 
Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And, and what I think it's saying is that we, we're not, we don't go to God in order to find something. Okay? We don't go to find something. We are supposed to become something. And then we will discover something. Because it's different. Blueprint says you need to go find it. Of how's it going to be? Where's it going to go? What's it going to do? The game plan says, no, that we need to be transformed. We need to become something. We need to become a follower of Christ. We need to become closer to him. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And when we do that, we will what? We will discover what God's will is. It'll be made clear to us. And so now I want to go back. We're going to go back to Jeremiah 29. Okay. But I want to read this. I, I taught you three words yes, last week when we were talking about reading the Bible. We're always supposed to read it what in? Yes. Yeah, three words. They're not the same. Context, context, context. Okay. And when I say it, we always read, read Scripture in the context of the verses around it. You read Scripture in the context of, of the book, the time, the, the audience. But you also read Scripture in the context of Scripture. Okay? So, let's go. Jeremiah 29. Let's go back to, we're not starting verse 11. We're going to start in verse 10. Because I, I want to get a little context here. It says, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And honestly, if you read on uh, to verse 13, I don't have it on there. It says that you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Okay. But, in other words, what, and go back a little bit further. If you go to verse 1 uh, of chapter 29, what you find is this actually, this is the transcript of a letter that uh, the prophet Jeremiah had sent to the remaining exiles who were in Babylon. In other words, I, I'm just going to say this. This ain't for you this, as an individual. And sometimes we take scripture that way. We go, oh, for I know the plans I have for you. Now the plans I have for Jeff. Isn't that how we read it? No, Jeremiah is saying this is written to the, pro to the exiles who are still in Babylon. He's saying this is what God's saying to you. This is what God's declaring to you. When the time in Babylon is done, I'm going to bring you back. Why? Because I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. And when you seek me with all of your heart, then you will find me. And, I, and this is, like I said, I think this is where sometimes we have a hard time uh, with, this, with this passage because we want to read it uh, that way. We want to apply it and put our name in there instead of you. And the thing is, it's not. It was you as a plural, as a group, as a people. And we take great promise from that. Okay, but it is not saying that everything in our life is going to be wonderful, rosy, and perfect. Not at all. And so, the, and, and here's the reason I think that a lot of people kind of have a problem with this. And, and this is one of the, the problems with the blueprint and game plan uh, illustration as well. Uh, we struggle with the concept of the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. We, we believe in so many ways that they are mutually exclusive. When nothing could be further from the truth. Okay? We, we can choose. We got all kinds of choices. We can, we can have Pop-Tarts or, or we can have bacon and eggs. It's our choice. Okay? I, we can choose where we want to work. We can choose where we want to go to school. I, we, we get to make all kinds of choices. We can choose to worship God. We can choose to stand outside and curse God. It is our choice, isn't it? So we have free will. But somehow we bought into this that if we have free will, that somehow that lessens the sovereignty of God. No, it doesn't. 
That, that does not lessen God at all. The fact is that God created everything. Okay, he spoke and it came into existence. And when he established the world, when he established the universe, when he established the order of everything, what did he do? He gave man free will in his sovereignty. I know we're like, oh, 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 oh. yes, in his sovereignty. God said, I am making all this. I have a plan. I have a purpose. I have a desire. We know that, that Jesus was... We know that Jesus was the Lamb of God slain before the foundations of the earth were laid. So we know that God has always had this plan. But the fact of whether or not we choose to get up on Sunday morning, okay, that is, that is free will. That is our choice to go and to come. That is the free will of man. And God has given us that. And in no way does that lessen his sovereignty. Uh, like I said, a lot of people go, well, my decision, if I make a decision, that means God's not sovereign because he didn't decide what I was going to do. But I'm here to tell you that because God said you do have the ability to decide what you want to do is what shows that he is sovereign. When we read scripture in, in context, that's when we start to see that it's complementary. And when I say I don't mean that it says nice things. I mean it complements it goes together one verse complements another a passage complements the other they go together and so when we read scripture i've always said it, we have got to be sure and yes you read a passage you read it in context of what is around it of who it was written to but you read it in the context of the whole bible the totality of scripture and so first and foremost if you ever feel that in your free will that somehow God is, is pointing you in a direction that goes counterintuitive to Scripture and to what the Bible says, I'm just going to tell you it ain't God that is pointing you that way. Okay? If you come to me and you tell me that you have a brand new revelation that has been revealed to you and it's never been revealed to anybody in the history of mankind, but God gave this to you, I'm going to tell you to run because it wasn't God. Okay, God has revealed himself in his totality of Scripture. Does he still, through his Spirit, speak to us? Absolutely. Does he, through his Spirit, reveal the Word to us? Absolutely. Does he, in our Spirit, does he, through his Spirit, speak to our Spirit and give us direction and guidance in making right choices, in choosing right rather than wrong? Absolutely. Okay? But the fact is that you know, he is, I, I, heard it, I heard it said, and I, and I love this, God predestines the plan, but not the man. Think about that for a second. God predestines the plan, not the man. We are not robots. We do not have step one, step two, step three, step four laid out, okay? Uh, and like I said, that kind of brings us back to, I think, our, our original question, you know, and that is, <laughs> okay, so... So if God doesn't have a blueprint for my life, but he has a game plan for my life, how in the world am I supposed to figure out what game plan I'm supposed to be on? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's a few things. And it's really it's quite simple. I mean, I say quite simple. Uh, they are some simple things for us to do. They're, they're sometimes harder said, or excuse me, harder done than said. Easy for me to say. Uh, Easier said than done, but I, there, there's some simple ones. Number one, uh, the first is that if we want to discover God's will, we need to seek out biblical guidance. God's word is there, uh, and, and it is always, 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 always to be our first step. Uh, when it comes to, to this journey of trying to figure out uh, where it is that God wants us to go, that's the first place we ought to turn, okay? Uh, you know, I have, and you can call it whatever you want. Ever since I got into ministry, if you ever noticed, if I come to a meeting, one of the things you will always see is I will bring my Bible, okay? I, business meeting, elders meetings, I, whatever it is, I always take my Bible. Now, to be honest, I don't always open it, okay? Uh, I, I'm not saying this because I'm like super religious and, I, and I'm, I'm like super... No, that's not it at all, okay? It is a reminder to me 
that if I don't know what to do and I don't know which direction to go, the first place I need to turn is to God's Word. That's the reason I take it with me everywhere. Whether, whether you're talking about in business or whether it is in church or whatever, I know that God has revealed Himself to me through His Word. And if I need to know what to do, that's the first place that I need to go. And so I carry my Bible for that reason, to be reminded of that fact. And also, so that if I need it, I can turn to it and find it. But it really, it's a reminder uh, as much as anything. Uh, God demands, there are some things that are clearly commanded and demanded that we act in certain ways. There are other things that are up for, you know, well, you know, I could, I mean, I could take this job or I could take that job and neither one takes me out of the will of God. The question is, which one's better? Okay. Well, there's a first place that you turn. Okay. And look for some guidance. The second place you turn is to the counsel of others. Uh, if, still saying, if you think you're, if you walk into a room and you think you're the smartest guy in the room, you're not. It's a proven fact. There, there are a lot of people that think that they know everything. They think they don't need anybody, that they've got it all figured out. And I'm just going to tell you, the only thing that that proves is that you ain't as smart as you think you are. We all need guidance. We all need counsel from others. And, and there, is, there is so much untapped biblical wisdom that is sitting in church sanctuaries all across the world this morning, never being tapped because nobody ever wants to go and ask them, because nobody thinks they know anything, because they're old, they don't understand the way we do things now, or because they're young, they haven't lived, so they don't know. No, I'll tell you what, we need biblical counsel of one another. That is the reason that we are many members, one body. Okay? One purpose. We are to glorify God. There are... Uh, invaluable assets that are out there that, that we ignore because we don't want to ask a question. So the first thing is if you're trying to determine God's will, you need to biblically, you need to go to biblical guidance, you need to seek the counsel of others. The other is we need to look at our gifts and abilities. I, I think one of the amazing things and the ways that we can determine God's will in our lives by taking an inventory of the ways in which he has gifted us, the ways in which he's given us intelligence or, or skills or that we do certain things uh, for certain tasks or positions. That, that gives us a lot of guidance uh, on his will for our lives. The other is by examining the passions within us, okay? When, when you have a burning desire for something, it may be to help the homeless, uh, it may be for young kids, it may be for youth, it may be for whatever it is. When you have a burning passion for that, does it not make sense that the God who created you placed that within you? Because the God who loves you and has a plan, a game plan for your life, has made you to serve in that area. And through our passions, through the things that just make us go, man, I can't walk away from it. No matter what it is, I'm always drawn back. I'm always drawn back. Okay? God's placed that within us. I, I have said it before. I, 15 years ago, I got into the ministry. Love preaching. Love to do it. Thought. Thought that, you know, I had because, you know, I'd seen everybody on TV. And so I thought that, you know, part of that was that that, that means you got to have this big, huge church. Okay. You got to have all of this stuff. That you got to have all this staff. You got to have all of the, I mean, that's the, that's what you do it. And I've, I'd been in management for a long time. I'd done sales management, everything else. So I really did. I saw my role of I was going to be an amazing administrator. Okay, for lack of a better word. That's what I was going to do. And so I was going to preach, but then you could, you could administrate all this. And, uh, and, and then I, I moved. And I found out that that's not the passion that I have. Okay, I thought it was. Find out it's not. The, the passion that God has placed in me is to be a part of the lives that, I am, that I'm leading. Those are my congregation. And I can't do that as an administrator. And, and so I, I found during that time, like I said, I, you know, we sit here and you talk about coincidences and, and different things. No, God has a game plan. And I think so many times we're off here and we are going, going, going. And God's can keeps going, no. And he kind of guides us back over here. You know, we're running, running, running. Whoa, hold on. 
No, no, no. We're, whoa, he keeps moving us back. Okay? And then one day we figure out, hold on, I kind of like this path. And we keep going that way. And, I, and that's so this whole idea of a blueprint versus a game plan, I do, I look at it. And the fact is that when we came back here, we we're coming on eight years. Hard to believe that we've been back here almost eight years. That's one of the things that I love is to, I love to preach. I love to teach, but you know what? I love to pastor. I really do. I, this may sound bad. I like going to the hospital. I know, I know it sounds horrible, but, I, but what I mean is that's where I, I like, I do. I'm sorry. My father-in-law told me at one point, he, he said, he goes, man, he goes, I, he goes, I hate weddings and I love funerals. And I thought, makes no sense. And then I started doing it and I figured out that's kind of, you know what? Because I do, the, that's, that's what I do is, is to try and comfort and encourage and, and to be there, Okay. And I mean, I still, I like doing weddings, so don't not call me, but that's, <laughs> but there are passions within us and there are things that we feel like we're just kind of between our giftings and our passions that we're drawn to. And I think that's, that opens us up to what God's will is for our lives. The second is opportunities. Uh, and I talk about, and I, like I said, not all about us, but 15 years ago we moved. Okay. Clay and I started praying in 2006, 2005, right around that time. Okay. In 2007, I decided this is what I'm, I'm going to do. I'm going to go into full-time ministry. And uh, when I did, I sat down and I mapped out, and I had about a five- to seven-year plan, okay? So I had, I, that's how I was going to get to be a lead pastor. It was a five- to seven-year plan. Now, if you're any good at math, what you know is that 2007, okay, in, in May of 2007, that does not give 15 years if I had my five to seven year plan. Okay. January, I think it was 6th. January 6th of 2008 was my first sermon preached here as the pastor of Antioch Christian Church. January 6th, 2008. God took my five to seven year plan, turned it into about eight months. He said, no, I got a place. Okay. Wayne Caswell always jokes that my my resume kept coming to the top. I thought it was because I was so gifted. Little did I know it's because they called another guy whose resume was on top of mine, and he said, no, I don't think I'm the guy. And mine was underneath it. So I guess I did rise to the top. The, the fact is that I think, you know, we can call them coincidences or whatever, but if we are open to the fact that God is working, then we see his hand at work all throughout our lives. And, and the danger is when we try to make it a blueprint rather than a game plan, number one, when things don't go the way that we think they should, we have a habit of questioning God and turning on God. We also have the danger then of not doing anything because we're afraid that we're going to make a wrong choice. We also get into this, this attitude that somehow it doesn't, make a it doesn't make any difference what decision I make here or there or anything else. And I just want to tell you, that is not the case. Okay, God has a plan for your life. And, and, I, and I've said it a thousand times, God wants... For you, what you would want for yourself, if you were as smart as he is, he loves you. And, and he has a plan and a purpose for you. But I also want to say this. Your game plan is for you. The, the game plan that God has for your life is the game plan for your life. Which means you've got to get in the game. You can't sit on the sides. You can't just wait. Okay, he wants us to be involved. But one thing that God also knows in his infinite wisdom, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to choose wrong. We're going to do it the wrong way. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to choose the wrong path. We are going to do the right thing, but do it absolutely wrong. And we're going to fail miserably. But that doesn't destroy his game plan for us. See, it destroys a blueprint. 
doesn't destroy his game plan for us. Because then he comes along and he does a little bit, I'm sorry to borrow the analogy, he does a little bit of coaching. He does a little bit of encouragement. He reminds us of where we are gifted, where we are talented, what he wants for us, and that he is behind us no matter what. And then he kicks us back out there on the field again to go. And the thing is that, that if we will, uh, Ephesians 5.17, it says this, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Life gets so much easier, so much easier, if we understand that He has a plan and He wants to use us. Not that everything is mapped out and laid out for us. And so, you know, when we say this, you know, God has a blueprint for my life. Please understand how dangerous that is as a belief. Does he have a plan for you? Absolutely. Does he want the best for you? Absolutely. But we all know it. Aren't there going to be mistakes? Aren't there times when the wheels are just going to absolutely fall off the bus? And we wonder how in the world we are going to go anywhere from here. Has anybody else been there? Is anybody else there? I want to tell you right now. If you are there, there is nothing that God wants to do any more than right now to sit down on the bench with you, and to talk to you, and to coach you. And to encourage you. And to remind you of what he sees in you. Not what the world sees, but what he sees in you. To remind you of how much you are loved. To remind you of how valuable you are in his eyes. And to remind you. It doesn't matter when you make mistakes. What matters is that you're trying. And you're putting your heart into it. He says, when you you seek me with all of your heart, then you will find me. I think that's what he wants you to hear today. Honestly, it's what he wants me to hear today. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to have our time of decision. And we're going to open up our prayer rooms. We're going to ask, I'm going to ask one of our elder teams to step in there. As if you are struggling, if you would like somebody to pray with you and pray for you, please step in there. Maybe you just need to bow your head where you are right now. Maybe you just need to, to sit back down.